Okay, that was fast. <laughs> so my name's Lee Atchison. I'm a Senior Director of Strategic Architecture at New Relic. Um, New Relic is a performance management company. We have a booth in that area right over there. Feel free to stop in. And uh, I'm an evangelist. I go around the world. I talk about, uh, um, uh, about uh, cloud, DevOps, those sorts of topics. I try not to talk too much about New Relic itself. I try and talk about technologies and thought leadership. Um, and so you actually probably won't even hear the word New Relic at all in the, in the, uh, uh, the presentation other than maybe at the very end. So, you have a problem. It's your big day. The day of the new product launch. It's Black Friday, election day. Election day in the US, of course, is a big problem. Uh, whatever the day, it's the busiest day of the year for you. It's the day your company will either make it or break it. You hold your breath. Are you able to scale? Can you stay operational? Will you survive that day? Your customers expect your product to be available. They expect your product to meet their needs at the time that they need it. They expect you to work all the time, and a failure of your application is a disappointment to your customer. Your customers aren't happy when you fail, and unhappy customers don't buy from you, and they actually tell other people. They have a right to complain, and complain they do. Maintaining application availability when you're properly scaled is critical to keeping your customers happy and your application running, and keeping customers coming back to your application. But the problem is many of us don't pay attention to what our applications are actually doing. We don't have visibility into how the application is functioning. Uh, when there's a lurking problem, we don't know about it until the problem raises its head and we have, a, have an incident. And so we end up hoping and wishing that your service stays up. And this, you can laugh at this, but more people do this than you might expect. They sit there hoping their applications don't have a problem until they get some sort of alert that says there is a problem. They don't do anything proactive to keep their applications running at the scale they need. They deal with the problems when it occurs, and they don't anticipate and plan for them in advance. They do things that put their applications in jeopardy, and they do things that add risk to their applications. And ultimately, risk is failure. So let me tell you a real life example. I'm gonna tell you about an overheard conversation. This is a real ops conversation, a report that an operations engineer did to his peers and to his management about something he was doing. And it is a true story, and I want you to see if you can see yourself or your company in the same sort of situation. So, we were wondering how changing a setting in our MySQL database might impact our performance. But we were worried that the change may cause our production database to fail. <coughs> Legitimate concern. Since we didn't want to bring down production, we decided to make the change to our backup replica database instead. After all, it wasn't being used for anything at the moment. Now, there's probably at least half of you in this room who've been in this industry for a while who know exactly what the next slide is going to be, and you're in fact exactly right. That's when the random act of nature occurred. The database went down. And then we remembered why we had a backup. Because since it was out of sync from what it was supposed to be, the backup failed as well. This is a problem that results from bad planning, bad decision making, result of not understanding the stresses on your system, and not having visibility and understanding what a change to your database can actually do to your system. This absolutely was a true story. It was a mistake, it was a problem. And I bet you more than one of you in this room have either done this or know somebody in your company who has done this. Anyone want to raise your hand? Okay, good, good. I, I often don't get people raising their hand at all, but they're sitting there like this, like this when I do that. But you know, it, it, it does happen. So this is not an uncommon story. And 
availability, you know, like this, it can come in all sorts of sh uh, shapes and sizes, availability problems. This one was a big, fat, obvious problem. But there's other ones that are much more subtle. For instance, imagine we had an e-commerce website. It was composed of a bunch of services and databases in the back end and a mobile app at the front end. Now, Bob comes along, he buys something, and that whole transaction takes 300 milliseconds. It's a good, good experience, Bob's happy, Bob goes home, everything's fine. But now Sally comes on and does the exact same thing. But this time, the database was a little bit slower, and the transaction ends up taking a lot longer. So she ends up being not happy, she had a bad experience, and so availability isn't just a matter of whether the page does what it's supposed to do, it matters how long it takes to do that. And the right answer, too late, is still not the right answer. So the customer doesn't care why a problem occurred. They don't care why your app is slow. If it doesn't meet their expectations at the moment they expect it to be there, nothing else matters. Now, if 10% of your transactions, I mean, if one out of 100 transactions, 1% 1 of your transactions happen to be a little bit slow and it results in that one customer not being happy, that's a 99% availability right there. The problem is that when we typically look at our application from an external view, this is usually what we see. We see overall 0.9 seconds, eh, not too bad. We think everything looks fine because from a surface, everything's operating reasonably on average. On average, it's pretty good most of the time. But the problem is the details are where the problems actually lie. The details are where availability problems are born. So the real answer to your application, um, how your application is doing, is not looking at it from this view, and it's not looking at averages. It's looking at the details, it's looking at the data. And in fact, modern applications you can't simply look at it from the outside in. You have to look at every level within the application, every service, how it's performing, how it's performing relative to who's calling it and how it's working, how your databases are working, how all your mobile apps are working, how everything's working for every transaction. We can't use average and sample data. We have to deal with every transaction. And this collects tons and tons and tons of data. In fact, what we find is that most customers with a properly instrumented application, the amount of monitoring data that they create from the application is significantly larger than the amount of business data that the application is dealing with. So if anybody's using your application, you must collect data about exactly how they're using it, the details, and the details are what's important. And it's not just server data or application data, it's not just uh, it, but it's also user experience, how are the users perceiving your application from working, and it's business outcomes. Are you meeting your business, business objectives and your business goals? This really is a big data problem. Doesn't matter how big your application is, it, monitoring it itself is a big data problem. So you must understand all parts of your application must understand how they all work together, you must understand the performance of every individual part of the application, and you must have visibility into every part of your application. Because if you don't have a visibility into your application, you don't have access to the data you need when a problem occurs, you'll waste time firefighting because you won't know where the problem is. You do meaningless finger pointing across teams as you're trying to figure out whose problem this really is. You lose money because you don't make any money when your application's down. Your customers will be unhappy, and as we know, unhappy customers tell other people. You need to understand how the application is working, how the customer is perceiving it, and whether or not it's meeting your business needs. You need to monitor all the right components, the right resources within your system. You need to monitor the right data, and success involves all three of these things. They're all interconnected. But this isn't enough. I mean, this is the old story, and 
most of you probably heard that story many, many times before. You know, visibility keeps your application running. That's the story of monitoring since the beginning of monitoring. The problem is the world is changing. The world is getting a lot more complicated. Our applications are also getting more complicated, and the world itself isn't static anymore. Used to be your world was composed of simple static data centers, right? Data centers where your application ran normally and all was well. Your operations team was comfortable. You know, they know what resources they controlled. They had a list of servers and spreadsheets they maintained. They had IP addresses and they were in the spreadsheet. And they even named the servers. How many people remember when you named servers? How many people named their EC2 instances? Okay. You know, the operations team was comfortable. They knew what they controlled and they managed it and it was something well-defined. All was simple and all was manageable. But in a modern world, of course, that just doesn't work. Our applications are much more dynamic, our resources are more dynamic, they're more sophisticated, and the customers are more sophisticated. So static data centers simply don't work anymore. We're rapidly outgrowing them. In the new world, resources are created dynamically on the fly. And the cloud, of course, is what allows us to make this happen. Whether it's public cloud or private cloud, it doesn't matter. The cloud is what, what allows us to deal with these dynamic resources and to create them and gives us the world of dynamic resources. The operations team, the world of the operations team is no longer something as simple as tracking resources in a spreadsheet. They have to be responsible for the dynamic world of how the application is actually running. The world has gotten a lot more complicated. And the dynamic cloud allows you to build applications better, allows you to build them faster. The way you've built them in the past, the way you operate them in the past, doesn't work in the future. So to kind of demonstrate what examples of this and what we're trying to talk about with this, uh, New Relic, about three years ago, we first did this survey. You know, we're, we're a, um, a SaaS provider, and so all of the data from our customers comes onto our servers, and we can do some uh, anonymous monitoring of that data to see trends in the industry that pop up. And so we, we wanted to ask a simple question. How long does an average Docker container run for in a production environment? And we expected a nice bell curve with some middle number. We didn't know what the middle number was, but that's kind of what we were expecting. But we didn't get that at all. What we got was this. This is a chart of the number of hours that a Docker container was running and the count of containers that were running for that period of time. And as you can see, there's some very long running containers. Our longest running container at the time we did this, the first time we did this, was 833 days, so over two years. A single container running for two years, which is kind of a scary thought in its own right. But you know, the average is about 200 days, which is also a very long period of time. And remember, this, this was about two, three years ago when we first did the survey. But what I thought was the most interesting was that leftmost column, the largest column, is Docker containers that were running for less than one hour. That was the largest individual column. So we looked at that and thought, okay, let's take care, let's get rid of all of this data, just take that one hour interval and expand it and see what it looks like within that day, within that one hour period. And this is what we got. So there's again some outliers, but the vast majority of the containers that we monitored, which at this point in time was 1.2 million containers, 11% of all of them that we, were, that we had as part of the survey, ran for less than 60 seconds. Now, the very first question I get when I first started showing this slide is, well, those are containers that are failing to start or break in some way. I said, no, 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 all those are excluded. These are only containers that have actually completed a startup or performing some business function and terminate in less than 60 seconds. Now, this is what I mean by a dynamic application and, and what I mean by dynamic resources. These are resources. This is a business logic within your application that gets allocated, instantiated, performs some function, and it's terminated in less than 60 seconds. Incredibly fast period of time. And this is the majority of Docker containers we were monitoring. 
And these numbers have changed over the years. We first did this about three years ago, and we keep updating the numbers you know, every few months or so. And the shape of the data doesn't change. The only thing that changes are the absolute numbers keep going up. Like, I think these are missing a zero from what the current numbers are. Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of containers. But what has been happening is they've been getting squished more to the left. They've been running for shorter and shorter periods of time. This is dynamic infrastructure at its finest. This is what we mean by dynamic applications and dynamic resources. So building dynamic infrastructures in the cloud, it allows you to scale your application faster, obviously. It also allows you to make changes to your application faster and respond to problems faster because it's much easier for you to, to deploy a new resource when the resources are being created and allocated at a much faster rate. Both of these ultimately result in higher availability. But only if you know what your application is actually doing. This brings an interesting question. In the dynamic cloud, um, you have dynamic resources, and those resources are coming and going rapidly, as I was just talking about. Instances are stopping and starting, you know, it's, whether it's containers or whether it's EC2 instances or whether it's Lambda functions, it doesn't matter. If the resources are coming and going so fast, how do you monitor them? How do you monitor a dynamic application in a dynamic cloud? Well, let's look at what, a, what is a dynamic application. Dynamic application is really something that allocates resources on demand. When it needs a resource to perform some business function, it creates that resource, usually from either a private or public cloud API, but it creates that resource. Uh, they can resize their resource needs on demand, and the provisioning process itself of those resources is not an independent action that's performed by some operations engineer. It's built into the application itself. It happens automatic as part of the application execution. It's dynamic. Applications are dynamic. They allow better scaling and allows higher availability in complex applications. So how, how do you get the visibility you need into how a dynamic application in production is running? Well, when you monitor dynamic application, you still have services, traditional services, accidentally did that, uh, services that it, you still have to monitor those services. And you probably, probably have servers that underline those services that, that uh, you have to monitor. And it's still an infrastructure you have to monitor. And you still have this interface to your customer and you care about what your customers are doing, the user interface and connections, whether it's mobile apps or whether it's a, it's a JavaScript in a browser, it doesn't matter. You still have that interface. You have to know how the customer is working. All of those traditional static monitoring things still have to occur. But you also now have this provisioning process. And how do you monitor the process of provisioning within a dynamic application? Given the resources are coming and going regularly, how do you monitor that? How do you monitor components that are there one moment and gone the next moment? They're gone 60 seconds later or less. Remember the Docker data. How do you monitor a resource that is there for a very short period of time like that? Well, it turns out that monitoring a dynamic application uh, in, in the dynamic cloud is, is different than monitoring a static application. You must still monitor each of the individual components. You still have to do that. Each of the services and resources and components that make up the application. And this gives you visibility in how those resources are actually functioning. That's all fine. But you also must monitor the life cycle of the cloud components because it not only matters that a resource was used, it matters when it was used. Uh, because just looking at a res the resources that are running right now, if you're trying to diagnose a problem, just look at the resources that are running right now, it doesn't give you any indication of what happened five minutes ago. It's just a different set of resources that were running five minutes ago. You need to understand what the resources were, which resources were there at the time the problem occurred because they're not the same resources you have running now. Those are the resources you need to look at for problem solving. So in the old world, you know, your, as I said, your operations team was comfortable. Resources were controlled. They created them. They managed them. 
The world was calm. Spreadsheets were nice and pretty. Everything was simple and manageable. Not quite, but yeah, we'll say that for now. But in this world, you know, with resources being created and destroyed dynamically, the resources are responsible for are dynamic and are transient. The world, their world, your world, is a lot more complicated. In the dynamic application, resources are constantly changing. New deployments are going out with new resource types are constantly changing. Monitoring dynamic application requires tracking what resources and that were running and when they were running. It means monitoring the provisioning process and understanding how that provisioning process is, was performing. It means monitoring the resource management processes to make sure they were functioning as you were expecting the management processes to function. And it means uh, you know, uh, all of this in addition to traditional static monitoring of the resources themselves and understanding what your services were, function were doing and what the normal performance characteristics were. The world is a lot more complicated. You know, it used to be a long time ago when I was a lot younger. Some of you were a lot, lot younger. The world was, um, you could monitor an application easily by just looking at how the server worked. You looked at the server, you looked at CPU, you looked at memory, you looked at network, right? And you saw these straight flat lines. CPU was flat, memory was flat, networking was relatively flat. If you have a, saw a little spike up in memory usage, that indicated a memory leak. If CPU usage changed more than you were expecting it to, it might indicate a server or service problem. Everything was static and everything was smooth. And change indicated a problem. Change was equated with a problem. But today, change is the normal operation. Resources are created and destroyed dynamically and everything is transient. So there is no static view of the world where change can be an indicator of a problem because change is the norm. Knowing what resources were being used when a problem occurred is just as important as knowing what the resources were. Um, the world's a lot more complicated. In this new complicated world, in order to monitor a dynamic application, you have to do top to bottom monitoring of the entire application, static monitoring of the resources, and the dynamic monitoring of the provisioning process. You must use dynamic instrumentation and dynamic monitoring. All of that to avoid this. Our customers today are demanding modern applications from us. It's a more complicated world. And modern applications require modern instrumentation. Visibility into our applications gives us the ability to innovate and build these modern applications that our customers are demanding. It gives you speed and flexibility in order to build the applications. You have to do this today. You cannot survive without dynamic applications today. You cannot survive with DevOps, without DevOps concepts today. By giving yourself the visibility in your applications that instrumentation, proper instrumentation can give you, you get confidence. Confidence that, that helps you develop, confidence that helps you scale. Visibility gives you confidence in your dynamic applications. It gives you confidence that the application can do the scaling for you, can do the resource allocation for you, and can survive and do the right things in order to keep your applications out of jeopardy and to keep, them, uh, keep the world from burning, keep things scaled, you have to do this. In the cloud, things are constantly in motion. Tracking resources is substantially more complicated today than it was before. Your world's gotten a lot more complicated. Dynamic instrumentation gives you visibility and visibility is what's key, dynamic visibility to give you confidence in using the cloud effectively for your modern applications. Thank you.
So before we get into questions, uh, so I am also the author of an O'Reilly book on scalability, and we have a bunch of copies here, and for everyone who asks a question, they, for the first four people to ask a question, you get a copy of the book. So. Four questions it is. Who has a question? No one. Okay. Oh, <laughs> really? No questions? No. Okay. Oh, oh. back there. Why is it always in the back? Ah, uh, two copies of you actually nice catch. catch it, yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, so the easy question, uh, a sure. little bit provoking. Uh, okay. Any open source solutions uh, could you uh, recommend uh, which do this end-to-end uh, -end, uh, monitoring? Uh, open source solutions for monitoring, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there's, I, let me answer a slightly different question. There's lots of different monitoring solutions out there, and most of them will do the right things for you if you understand what your needs are and set them up correctly. There are some that do a better job than others. I happen to like New Relic, obviously. I work there. But you don't need to use New Relic to do any of the things that I talked about here. You just need to understand what it is that you need to see within your application, and it's not just the code and how it functions. You need to understand how the resources are being used amongst each other and how they're, how they're moving around, the, you know, the dynamic provisioning and all that sort of stuff. You need to be able to see all of that. You don't have to use New Relic to do it. I want you to, there's advantages to it, but you don't have to. And any of the open source monitoring or non-open source packages can help you as well. Thanks. <laughs> Next to you, there's another question. You have to come up here, actually. <laughs> if you want, there you go. Sure, thank you. If you stick around afterwards, I'll sign it if you want. <laughs> if you don't, you don't have it. <laughs> so, Any other monitoring. Oh, question. <clears throat> so, you just said set up monitoring. And oh, okay, hello. Um, know what you need, but experience tells me that usually about. Well, you can set up your application and your monitoring as good as you want, but a, a couple of months after, you're going to have about as many metrics after incidents because you were blindsided. And you didn't know you had those blindsided because you're getting blindsided. So is there any way, any technology, any artificial intelligence to help you proactively start monitoring things that you didn't even know you needed to monitor. A absolutely, and uh, I made a promise I wasn't gonna do a product pitch, and I'm not going to, but stop over at the booth and we can give you some more insights into how all that works. Um, but again, there are other companies that do that too. We do have um, some relatively good AI that can help you figure out um, you know, where you're, you know, there's two problems that tend to, to come up that AI can help with. The, the one of not having enough data is something that's pretty easy to identify and to know where you, know, where you need to instrument that you haven't instrumented yet. That's a pretty easy problem to solve. The harder one is when you instrument everything the way you really should and you get this ton of data, figuring out, okay, what piece of data really is most important to me that I should be looking at at a regular basis. What we actually find is that most Incidents that are they go by undetected aren't because you know, in, a, in a properly instrumented system aren't because the instrumentation missed it. They were because the the data was collected and ignored because there was no trigger on it or there was nobody who noticed that a problem was occurring until later. So it, it, it helps with diagnosis afterwards, but you'd like to know that ahead of time. Yeah, that's exactly and the question. AI, yeah, and AI actually is really good for that. And we have some good AI solutions for that. It's, it's really good at taking that large collection of data, looking for the anomalous behaviors and detecting things that can cause problems ahead of time before the problem occurs. That's honestly, so f plug for a second, that's the difference between basic open source systems and a more commercial system like what we provide. There's a question over here. Oh. And come on up if you want. Great catch. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Sure. Uh, just wondering, uh, during development, to ask the developers how much, you know, how, how does the monitoring hook in? Right. How much do you have to uh, plan ahead? So, I'm sorry, would you say that again? <laughs> so, for development, 
for the architecture of your application? Uh, how much do you have to plan ahead? Uh, That's actually the good part. Um, you actually don't have to do that much. You know, we, one of the things we try and do is we try to make it very easy for you to add instrumentation to your application. In a lot of cases, it's adding a line or two of code. That's all you have to do. In some cases, you don't even have to do that. Um, in most languages, for most types of services, it's that simple. Now, there are things you can do, you know, once you, and that will give you basic application monitoring. That will give you infrastructure monitoring. What you won't get with that is business metrics monitoring. And that requires usually a lot more foresight. You need to think through what are the, the business metrics that you really care about the most and then instrument specifically those particular business metrics because we don't know what those are. You have to tell us what those are. And so that usually involves putting a probe into your code at wherever you identify some business activity occurring, like a add to cart or a purchase complete or something like that, putting the right code in the right place to collect that piece of data. So um, you know that's a lot more involved and it's because it's tied to how your application is actually working. But basic application monitoring, all you have to do is add a line or two of code. And again, this is true with any of the solutions. Very true with New Relic. You just add a line or two of code and you can get a lot of useful data very, very quickly just by doing that. Yeah, thanks. Another question over there in the back. If you wanna come on, come up for the. Hi, good morning. Thank you morning. for the talk. Sure. Um, do you feel that typically applications are developed in a way that they produce too much monitoring data than necessary? No. Um, I would rather have, especially in the world where AI really does what you need it to do, uh, and it, which is getting better and better as time goes on. I'd rather collect too much data and ignore most of it and throw it away than not to have the data I need. And, and AI will help use that data to find the problem in advance. But even if it doesn't find it, if you're diagnosing a problem or doing a post-mortem on a problem, you want data around the time of the problem in very deep detail. And if you don't collect it in advance, you won't have it. So even if you don't find the problem in advance, and you have an incident and you have to deal with the incident afterwards, having that data to help you figure out what happened so you can fix it and avoid it in the future is still critical. So I don't think it's a problem that you end up with more monitoring data than you do application data. It's just something you need to deal with. And that's another problem with some of the open source solutions is you have to store that data someplace. You have to deal with it yourself. And uh, the, okay, I'll say it. One of the advantages of New Relic is we store all that data for you. We're a SaaS service and we take care of all that for you. Thank you. Sure. Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, I, that's the last of the books I have here. We have about a, do a dozen or two more at our booth if you want to come by, ask questions there too. And uh, glad to give you a, uh, a copy if you're the first dozen or so people that come over. But I'll still answer questions if you have any more. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, like, hi. Hello. <laughs> um, how is it about um, how long do you store logs nowadays? So, is that just like a week, a month? Yeah, it actually varies. And what's actually becoming more and more common is to store different data, uh, different data from different sources for different periods of time. So most data you probably want to store for at least a couple of weeks. Um, some data you want to store for a much, much longer period of time. A lot of it depends on what you're trying to do with it. One of the common things that dictates that for you nowadays is comparisons. You know, how did my app perform compared to what it did a week ago or a month ago? And wherever you want to make those comparisons, you need to make sure you have enough data for that. Week over week is a, is a very basic comparison that most people do. You need two weeks of data to do that. So rarely do you see data that's anything but the most, you know, noisy data um, collected for less than a couple of weeks. Uh, but some data you want to do a year over year analysis, especially business metrics and things like that, and so that you'll obviously keep a lot longer. So you'll, you'll tune the, the um, retention based on the type of data. But it's typically at least two weeks and sometimes significantly longer. I would say probably two weeks, three months, and one year are the most common types of durations. Okay, thanks. Sure. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, oh. Thank you very much.